Okay, please welcome Jackie Hollick. Thank you, Mike. Okay, I'm just going to share with you in the next probably 10 to 15 minutes just the background that we've been through since you're quite right, Mike, from 2009 was when we started with the positive behaviour framework in Western Australia. And it's been a really, really exciting time that we've been on a journey where we've, we've been discovering about behaviour and around positive behaviour support and challenging behaviour and what is all that about. And very early on we did realise that we often get stuck looking at the behaviour when we talk about challenging behaviour and we think that we need to fix behaviour. And we learnt very quickly that if you concentrate on the behaviour, you're going to lose sight of the person. So what we need to concentrate on is the person and meeting people's needs. And quite quickly, you don't have to worry about the behaviour. And that's something that we learned really quickly from the very beginning. Um, but what we also learnt fairly early on was that as a government department working with non-government disability sector organisations within the positive behaviour framework and looking at joining together, working truly as a partnership, that we hadn't asked the most important people about what, what is this stuff around behaviour. And that was people with disability and their families. And so again, we realised that we needed to be talking more to people who are experiencing challenging behaviour because they, they basically were the experts in, in what happens with this stuff. So when we started with the positive behaviour framework, I'm just going to show you a couple of slides which are quite busy but it gives you an idea of what's been going on for the last, well, six years. Um, around at the beginning, we didn't really engage that well with families and we, we were really slow and Ron was quite right. It takes a long time but I think we were quite slow at the beginning because we hadn't got everybody at the table. My last slide will show you the extensive and important influence that families have had on our work with the positive behaviour framework. And I believe that it's essential that that continues into the future. <laughs> so it is very busy, um, but as you can say, this is what we call a positive behaviour framework stage one. And in stage one, way back then, we'd started to tinker around with some beha um, positive behaviour and action interest groups. We had a, a positive behaviour team and we had a consultation team and Mike Cubbage who is, has, has driven a lot of um, what's been happening under the positive behaviour framework stage one down at the front here and particularly around family leadership um, heads up that consultation team. We did start to look at some evaluation of what actually works when we're looking at positive behaviour support. We also interestingly did um, embark on substantive equality evaluation at that time um, which has given us a lot of information around how we do engage at a wider level across the whole state and particularly with um, Aboriginal people. And our very first um, report that came out was the Towards Responsive Services for All report. Some of you may know that or have seen that, um, but it was um, a wonderful report which basically started our journey. It had nine recommendations um, and Quite rightly, we've gone way past those early nine recommendations. We did achieve them, but we've done so much more since. Um, we then developed the um, behaviour support service, um, more positive behaviour teams, and a guiding committee, which is the 45, 46 people um, group that Ron referred to um, earlier. And then, as you can see, is our, our little box here, the family leaders and leadership project. So we embarked on a project <coughs> with uh, many families who are here today to look at how we can have an influence on this very government-centric type of approach that we're doing at the very early days. And you can see in this diagram here that there are two areas that that group had an influence on and it was on our actual behaviour support services themselves. So the services that were be being provided by a range of clinicians with families around exploring what it is that makes a difference in people's lives around challenging behaviour. We realised that at the end of that, what happens? And the service was intended around sustainability, around in helping families to identify into the future what will make a difference. But what really does make a difference is that not only that, but that plus 
the connection with other families, other families who have been through that experience, those families who can join together and they can share things. You can share things amongst yourselves that a clinician group can't do. We also designed um, effective service design report, which was pre predominantly for disability sector organisations around what are the elements you need to look at um, when you're, you're designing a support. So there's a very formal way of perhaps of looking at it, but what it did do was break down those traditional um, ideas around quite a scientific approach. And this was around, hey, really, you need to get to know the person well. You need to know what the person's needs are and how your service is going to meet those. It's pretty much as basic as that. We had um, what we call a voluntary code of practice for the elimination of restrictive practice. This was a really important um, point in our journey where we suddenly focused on something that was not so positive, the restricted practices that people experience across our state. And we realised something serious needed to happen about this. We started to talk about the fact that for very good reasons people have started to use restricted practices in order to control behaviour. And not just disability sector organisations, not just schools. Families have learnt ways that have been able, enabled them to survive although it may use restrictive practices. And so we joined together um, in looking at what might be a way forward together to think about how we might eliminate or reduce those restrictive practices. And we've, uh, the next slide will show that we've actually had a review of that which has engaged with families to really understand what that means. Restrictive practice is not a bad thing. It's a thing that's happened, um, but it's a thing that needs to be reduced or eliminated to look at much more positive ways of supporting um, people with disability. We also had a sector and workforce development um, evaluation report during this first day, which looked at how sector organisations were able to use strategies to support the people that they support. But probably one of the most important things that came out of this first stage was the side-by-side -side project. And there's, there's very, very many families here that I can see who are a strong part of that first project. And you'll hear more about the side-by-side -side project later, but it was a really innovative way of bringing um, families together to be able to support each other. <coughs> so this slide is our next stage, basically stage two up until now. And you can see the strong influence that families have had in all the work that's happening under the um, positive behaviour framework. So we basically have um, some of the disability sector organisations have a consultant group. Um, so they meet to share ideas and again it's very much a joint approach. We expanded some of the workforce development work into a regional area down in the southwest and lower Great Southern <coughs> to again look at what are the elements in disability sector organisations that are going to be important to improve people's lives. And we also have embarked on an evaluation of what are the elements that are required in services um, to make a difference. But as I said, the important stuff is this stuff on the right around where families have, um, have walked alongside us, I suppose, in looking at some of these um, areas. You may have, um, have already heard or seen um, the Is There a Better Way training and some of the more than talking training. Um, this is part of some of the training that's been around. I suppose initially the Is There a Better Way was set up, I think, as a, um, a training program for the Code of Practice. So that was a, a very formal way of looking at how we might share the Code of Practice across the state. But it grew, I think, and changed quite dramatically as time went by. And I believe mainly families now really go to the Is There a Better Training, um, Is There a Better Way training. Initially, it was families alongside service providers. So there was um, an understanding that the service provider <laughs> and families needed to work together and so therefore receive that training together. But what it did do through some really good um, planning in that training was look at experiences of families, understanding why restricted practices might happen and then looking at alternative ways to do that. And restrictive practices can be something quite major as locking a door, or it could be minor or seems to be minor as locking a fridge door. And there are very valid reasons, thank you very much, as to why both of those may have happened at the beginning. So is there a better way 
training and the more than talking training has been really um, well received as well. Um, Debbie Lobb um, set that up for us around looking at communication and looking at communication in a very different way. We've always looked at communication as something that we, we do for, for specific reasons and we have ideas about what those reasons are. But when you actually bring it right down to basics, communication is about relationships. And Debbie and others are going to talk about the importance of those relationships in people's lives when it comes to change and behaviour. We've also embarked on a project to explore positive behaviour support in a school setting. And this, we thought the, the framework as a whole was slow. This is slow. Um, trying to engage with um, education systems, which are huge, and look at positive behaviour support slightly differently to perhaps the way we do um, has been a real challenge, but there has been so much that we're learning from this around how schools look at um, positive behaviour support within their system. And I hadn't realised, um, but there are about 125 schools in our state who are engaged in something called positive behaviour support in schools. So it's already happening. I actually didn't know that. And so now that we've got together, we're looking at how we can just jointly partner in our sense of what positive behaviour support is in schools. Um, as I said before, we've revised, revised the Code of Practice, the Elimination of Restrictive Practices, and that's an ongoing work that will continue to be revised as we learn more and more about what restrictive practices are. Um, we have had a really exciting pilot project with the local area coordinators in Albany. So for anybody here from Albany, we have embarked on looking at how we might value add to some of the wonderful work the LACs are doing out in, in areas rather than, um, I suppose, um, the assumption that a referral to somewhere is needed when challenges of behaviour occurs. And the latest project that we're just about to embark on is um, a project around trying to, to, uh, trying to engage better with Aboriginal people, um, particularly originally it was around the code of practice for the elimination of restrictive practices, but this will grow, I think, into a broader um, yarning session, I think, around what is it that we need to do better to make sure that Aboriginal people have equal access to some of the supports that are available. And that, I think, in diplomat is going to be a big challenge, the whole of state-wide, so we're going to try and get out into many parts of the state um, to look at how that might work. But I think, for me, the reinforcement here is when I was looking at the work that we've been doing over the last six years, that this second slide shows that the importance <coughs> of family leadership, family connection, so pleased to see so many people here. I'm privileged to be here.